name is Robert Dunn. I am a member of the State Water Control Board. I will serve as the hearing officer for tonight's hearing. Before I introduce the staff, I would like to clarify that the State Water Control Board is a policy making body of citizens appointed by the governor and empowered by law to adopt regulations and issue permits. The Department of Environmental Quality is an agency of the state executive branch with the responsibility for administering its relevant laws and regulations adopted by the board. I am not a member of the department. In addition, I would like to point out that relevant state and federal laws and regulations are the basis for the action taken by the board and the department. Neither board or the department has the authority to change the laws. This time I'd like to introduce the principal DEQ staff present. I, you probably already met them earlier, but Mr. Mike Murphy, regional director. Mr. Kyle Winter, next to me, he is deputy regional director. Mr. Joe Bryant, who is a water permit writer. We will be taking all public hearings for the official record. We have a court reporter and we have and it will be taken. The hearing will close at 11.59 p.m. on July 21st, 2016. The State Water Control Board is holding this hearing to receive comments on the proposed reissuance of Virginia Pollution Discharge and Animation System Permit Number EA-0004146. For Virginia Electrical and Power Company's Chesterfield Power Plant. Most of the hearing is published in the Richmond Times Dispatch on June 6th and June 13th, 2016. Notice of the hearing is also published in the Style Weekly on June 8th and June 15th, 2016. This fact finding proceeding is being held pursuant to Section 2.2-4019 and 62.1-44.1510 of the Code of Virginia and the Board Procedural Rule Number 1. The State Water Control Board will ultimately decide whether to reissue, revise, or reject the permit. There will be no decisions made tonight. Let me restate that again. There will be no decisions made here tonight. The State Water the State Water Control Board will be making decisions on this proposed three issues at the next board meeting in September. Please be assured that we will consider all relevant information that you present regarding proposed activities. The general procedures for the hearing will be as follows. Mr. Kyle Winters will make a staff presentation followed by a statement from the representative of the Virginia Electrical Power Company. Next, I will call on any elected officials or other representatives, followed by those people who have indicated on the sign of sheet that they wish to comment. Finally, we will hear from anyone else who would like to make a statement. When you speak, please state your name and who you represent if it's other than yourself. As a hearing officer for this public hearing, I reserve the right to restrict comments based on length of time and repetitive comment. Each speaker will have three minutes to reduce repetitive comments. If you agree with the previous speaker, you can just say, I agree with him and not repeat their comments. Again, each speaker will have three minutes. The end of three minutes will ask you to close your comments if you're not finished. We will record all public comments for inclusion in the official record Public comment period for this permit will close on June 21st, 2016. This time I'd like to call on Mr. Winters to give a staff presentation. Thank you, Chairman Dunn. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kyle Winter, Deputy Regional Director with the Department of Environmental Quality's Piedmont Regional Office. On June 2nd, 2009, DEQ received an application from Virginia Electric and Power Company for the reissuance of Virginia Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or VPDES, permit number VA0004146 for discharges from the Dominion Chesterfield Power Station to the James River in Chesterfield County. 
Addendum to the application were received on July 8, 2009, October 8, 2009, July 21, 2015, October 19, 2015, November 19, 2015, February 12, 2016, March 7, 2016, May 9, 2016, and May 23, 2016. The applicant proposes to continue discharging once through condenser cooling water, treated industrial wastewater, and stormwater. In addition, the applicant proposes to release wastewaters from dewatering activities associated with the closure of the coal ash ponds at the facility. The closure of the coal ash ponds is being performed pursuant to a 2015 United States Environmental Protection Agency final rule that regulates the disposal of coal combustion residuals. Coal combustion residual surface impoundments have been regulated under the 50s program during their operational life. The Virginia Waste Management Board solid waste management regulations apply after their operational life and provide for closure requirements in 9 BAC 2081-370. The long-term management of these impoundments includes closure, post-closure, and ground and surface water monitoring which will be addressed by the Solid Waste Program in accordance with the Virginia Solid Waste Management Regulations and Requirements, and the EPA rule is applicable. Existing groundwater monitoring, corrective action, and or risk assessment plans currently in effect under the VIPTES permit will remain in effect until such time that they are superseded by a groundwater monitoring program pursuant to a solid waste permit for closure and post-closure. The permit limits for the discharge of one through condenser cooling water are based on combined flows of 1,054 million gallons per day. The permit limits for the discharge of wastewaters from dewatering activities are based on a maximum flow of 5 MGD, or million gallons a day. The application was provided to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Game and Animal Fisheries, and Department of Conservation and Recreation on December 16, 2015, May 20th, 2016, and May 27th, 2016. Notice of the proposed permit action and public hearing was published in the Richmond Times Dispatch on June 6th and June 13th, 2016. Notice of the proposed permit action and public hearing was also published in Style Weekly on June 8th and June 15th, 2016. DEQ sent the public notice to the Chesterfield County Administrator, the Chairman of the Chesterfield County Board of Supervisors, and the Richmond Regional Planning District Commission on June 6, 2016. DEQ also sent the draft permit, the draft fact sheet, and the public notice to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Game and Animal Fisheries, Department of Conservation and Recreation, and EPA on June 6, 2016. The public comment period totals 45 days, establishing a period for providing written comment before the public hearing that exceeds the minimum requirements and a shortened period for providing written comment after the public hearing. The comment period for this permitting action closes on July 21st, 2016. During the public comment period to date, the Department of Environmental Quality has received comments from more than 540 citizens via electronic mail. DEQ staff will summarize and prepare responses to all comments and present them to the State Water Control Board for their consideration. The comments for some bonds document will be posted on DEQ's website. This concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. At this time, I'd like to call on representative of the J. Lepton Power Company. I believe that's Ms. Taylor. My name is Kathy Taylor. I'm the Senior Environmental and Sustainability Advisor for Dominion. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments tonight associated with the draft water permit renewal for the Chesterfield Power Station. Since Chesterfield Power Station began operations in 1944, it has been an important part of our generation fleet. Today, Chesterfield is the largest fossil fuel power station in Virginia and supplies about 12% of the electricity in Dominion's service territory. It is also an important asset to the community and local economy. With 257 employees supporting operations 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to ensure reliable energy for our customers. Over the last decade, Dominion has implemented significant environmental improvements at the station with nearly a billion dollars invested in air pollution control equipment alone. This equipment has doubled the size of the station's footprint and has positioned it as a nation leader among other coal stations in reducing air emissions. 
The next phase of environmental improvement at the station involves the closure of two coal ash ponds and conversion to dry ash management as well as other wastewater enhancements. The draft permit under consideration by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality is a Virginia Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit renewal that incorporates new stringent water limits that will apply to the station. These new stringent limits and monitoring requirements are associated with the station's plan to close the ash ponds as required by the coal combustion residual rule and implementation of new requirements under the effluent limitation guidelines from the Environmental Protection Agency. Dominion has developed a proactive plan for complying with these rules and our schedule is well ahead of the required regulatory deadlines. The permit renewal will govern all water releases from the station, including closure of the ash ponds, scrubber operations, low volume waste, and leachate and will set progressively stricter limits to improve the water quality of the discharges from the station over the next six years. Permit limitations have been set using well-defined scientific methods to ensure that water releases from the station to protect aquatic life and other uses of the James River. In regard to the closure of the ash ponds, Chesterfield is unique because unlike other generation stations where we're closing ash ponds in Virginia, we continue to burn coal at this station. Dominion is constructing a new on-site state-of-the-art line landfill to safely manage future ash generated. Only after the new state-of-the-art landfill is constructed can we begin closing the ash ponds. The first step in closing the ponds is to remove the water. This step is also known as dewatering and will be similar to what is already underway at our Brimo and Possum Point power stations. During the dewater process, we will treat the water using a multi-stage process prior to release. The draft permit includes a requirement for Dominion to submit a conceptual engineering report to DEQ that describes the wastewater treatment system that will be used to ensure compliance with the very strict discharge limits set in the permit. This, the conceptual engineering report must be approved by DEQ before we can begin constructing the wastewater treatment system. It is important to note that the Chesterfield draft permit incorporates the additional measures being implemented at Dominion's Possum Point and Brimo power stations, both of which use frequent in-process monitoring for key parameters and threshold concentrations at or below water quality standards to trigger when enhanced treatment will be used. Prior to release, the water will be tested by a third party to ensure it meets federal and state requirements. The draft permit requires sampling to be conducted three times a week with weekly reporting to DEQ. Dominion will post these results weekly on the website. We're committed to doing this right. We live here too and want to ensure our neighbors and the communities know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how. We expect water releases as part of the ash pond closures will begin in the fall of 2017 once the conversion to dry ash management is complete and the on-site dry ash landfill is operational. After we remove the water from the ponds, we will permanently seal the sites by covering them with a synthetic cap, two feet of soil, and grass. This engineered cover system will protect groundwater by preventing rainwater from reaching the ash. We will monitor and the groundwater for at least 30 years. Regarding other wastewater discharges from the station, the draft permit sets new lower limits that will require the design and installation of a number of new treatment processes, including a new wastewater treatment system for low volume waste. The draft permit also includes thermal limits that ensure aquatic life in the James is fully protected. As part of our plans to comply with EPA's final 316B rule, Dominion will complete biological studies and technology evaluations as specified in the draft permit to ensure potential impacts of water withdrawals are addressed as well. We support the draft permit to allow completion of the project in full compliance with state and federal requirements. The permit renewal is cons considerably more stringent than the existing permit includes significant reductions in effluent limits and will be fully protected of human health, water quality, and aquatic life in the James River. Thank you for this opportunity to provide comments on the draft permit. Thank you. Again, my name is Nicole Anderson Ellis. I'm Vice Chair of the Enrique Capitalist Soil and Water Conservation District Board. And I thank you very much for this
this opportunity to provide feedback on this draft for them. Um, the NRI Couple of Soil Water Conservation District is an independent government body, but we share our boundaries with Enrico County, which means that this permit and this facility are um, discharging water across from our southernmost tip of our district. Um, over the last year, we've been very working with the DEQ on how to address the EPA's requirements about closing these coal ash ponds while simultaneously guarding the natural resources of our district and the entire region. And toward this end, we request the following revisions to this draft permit. As written, the permit would allow this facility to discharge arsenic, cadmium, chromium, copper, lead, mercury, nickel, selenium, silver, and zinc. Virginia's laws allow industrial facilities, factories, and power stations, among them, to release heavy metals into our waterways, but the levels permitted here exceed those known to harm aquatic wildlife. We ask that the water entering the James be held to a higher standard than it currently is in this uh, uh, me, <laughs> permit, and that the revised permit require Dominion to pre-treat water to bring the levels of these heavy metals below the lo known threshold for biological risk fish, and other aquatic wildlife. Likewise, the current draft would allow Dominion to release into the James River water that it is, is at a temperature high enough to harm fish and other aquatic wildlife. We ask that the next draft require further cooling. Indeed, we ask that these standards of treatment be applied to all water releases from the, this facility, including leachate from the coal, ash, landfill, and stormwater. I'd also like to suggest a revision speaking not as a member of the Soil and Water Conservation Board, but as a citizen of the region, an active paddler, and a mother. The current draft of this permit provides for 30 years of care. I was glad to hear that I'm to a minimum of 30 years, but the heavy metals we're discussing will be as dangerous 30 years from now as they are today. I, uh, I like to think that in 30 years, my daughter, who is now 11, will be taking her children on the James River to paddle and to swim and to fish, and I want to make sure that they are safe as well. So I w would ask that we revise this draft to include a long view plan for ongoing monitoring and care. And finally, it should be noted that if this permit were to suddenly require Dominion to relocate their toxic waste piles away from the tidal shores of the James River, we'd fully support that request. Thank you. Thank you. Flannery, I come here from Loudoun County because I'm concerned about Dominion's reputation, uh, particularly when it comes to questions of clean water, among other things. Uh, I am not here as an elected official, although I am elected uh, in Loudoun County to the Soil and Water Conservation District there, and I'm the treasurer of that district. Uh, I'm concerned about mingling millions of gallons of water with heavy metals, as referenced by the last speaker, mercury, lead, arsenic. It's a deadly menace, A, to humans, B, to the life of the river, and also to aquatic life. And at a time when the sturgeon we've discovered is apparently recovering from what we believe was its extermination into extinction. Yet, here we are talking about what levels of poisons we may release into the James River. The, uh, what are our concerns? I share the same concern about the temperature of the water coming out. I reference it supposedly in the 90s. If that's the temperature of the water, we have to talk about it being cooler. We have to be concerned about this uh, toxic soup that we're preparing to release into the James River, intending to do so, um, and whether or not that compares to the negligence that occurred in Flint, Michigan. And remorse and regret is not an acceptable approach to how we deal with the safety of our rivers and water. And what downstream lives because that river lives, placed there because that river lived. Uh, we propose to mimic the BREMO permit, as I understand it. And that was appealed and revised and improved. And it can be improved again and should be improved again. Uh, it's too late after the trigger hits to deal with the remorse that we should have done more. And yet, that's where we stand, at that threshold. We must enhance the treatment of the discharging waters, and we must have stricter, allowable thresholds, as the last speaker said, and I joined her in that respect. For that respect. The volume of the discharging waters, uh, if we go forward with this, have to be decreased, along with the velocity of the waters that we're proposing. And the samples of fish tissue and so forth to determine uh, the viability of aquatic life, 
there has to be a time reference to when the sample is taken and when a report must be given so that the feedback loop actually means something when we are testing uh, the tissue to see what dangers, if any, are being presented by the discharge into this river. Thomas Jefferson gave us some instruction on how to measure environmental offenses. Uh, Jefferson thought the proposition self-evident. He said this in a letter to Madison. Um, quote, that the earth belongs and usufruct to the living. Usufruct is a term I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Mr. Dunn. By that term, usufruct, Jefferson meant that while one may derive a benefit from a river, the James in this case, the fructus, the fruit, one may only use the river if one doesn't alter uses. So that there is something for her daughter to go into a stream with perhaps her children years from now, and that people may fish and may use the river and so forth. Yes, I can, uh, as, as verbose an Irishman as I may be. Uh, it's, it's said that uh, one of the defense all the time is that it has to be economically feasible. Well, that's fine. We've been underwriting toxic uh, fossil fuel plants and should not underwrite this by our health and the risk to the life of the river. Thank you, sir, for your time. Thank you. The Greenbelt meeting, uh, this one was a lot better. I also I have a hard time understanding part, parts per million and volume and velocity. Um, but I do want to thank you and you guys can go on a little bit better. Thank you. I'm a citizen. I live in Chesterfield County. I've paddled on the river in that vicinity of the, of the discharges. and. Uh, I'd like to echo some of the earlier concerns here with regard to the discharges and the use of a mixing zone. I don't want to be paddling in a mixing zone. I think that's pretty ridiculous. I think we should clean up the discharges so we don't have to worry about uh, exposure uh, in that uh, area of the river that is being designated as a mixing zone. And I agree, uh, the critters that live in that river uh, uh, don't know that it's a mixing zone and they uh, wander in there and they're getting exposed to higher levels of pollution. Um, Frankly, I think the permit needs to be more stringent. Uh, just to give you an example, um, the standards that were established uh, with Brimo uh, were not the standards that DEQ agreed to, but the standards that were reached as a result of a settlement. So DEQ needs to raise the bar. And with regard to the State Water Control Board, Mr. Dunn, um, I've been to many of those meetings in the past, and uh, you tend to basically go along with DEQ. And I would suggest to you that you ask some tough questions, listen to citizens' testimony, and not take the EQ's word for it, because frankly, um, I don't think that uh, uh, they necessarily do the best job uh, when it comes to these permits. And that Remo case is a very good recent example of that. Um, I want to point out too that there was an article in the Richmond Times Dispatch uh, about uh, testing. Duke University has been able to establish the fact that. Uh, they can actually determine if pollutants in the river are coming from coal ash. And they did some testing. This is an article that was in the paper on, uh, let me get this right here, uh, June the 10th, uh, in the Richmond Times Dispatch. And uh, they, they're using isotopes of various chemicals like boron. And they, they found that the, and they tested the water above the plant, and then they tested the water below the plant and they tested for boron, and they found that the boron levels were eight times higher than the background levels above the plant in the sample they took below the Chesterfield plant, and that uh, the arsenic was 17 times, 17 parts per billion in one sample, 17 times more than the background level, again, above the river. Um, those are probably, well, I wouldn't say that. These, these levels are the result of discharges, I guess, both the ones from the existing permit, as well as from groundwater contamination. And I am concerned as to whether or not this permit gets at that groundwater contamination that is an issue in the Chester, Chesapeake facility right now. Um, so it's really important, I think, to take a look at uh, this. I think if you leave the coal ash in the ground, you'll have continued groundwater contamination. I know this was not supposed to be a waste permit issue, but since the DEQ represents, since the Dominion representative talked a lot about the waste permit, I'll, I'll end with this statement. Dig it up. Dig it up and move it to a solid waste landfill away from the river. It will never be 
uh, safe where it is or continue to be contamination. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Tyler Madison, 4896 Burnham Road in North Chesterfield. And uh, I'll just read a few comments here. Um, the, uh, the Chesterfield Power Station sits by tidal water. Um, has the DEQ considered the effects of sea level rise and more intense storms that are likely because of climate change? Uh, did DEQ consult with the experts on that issue and who, who were those people? And then also, um, is DEQ aware that excavation and removal is being implemented at numerous coal ash sites around the southeast, as we know in North Carolina from that article that was just mentioned to you, and that at one site, excavation led to a rapid and dramatic drop in groundwater contamination levels. I respectfully request that the coal ash sites be excavated and removed uh, to a line repository safely away from streams and rivers. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Jamie Bronco. I serve as the Lower James River Keeper at the James River Association. James River Association is a nonprofit organization um, with a mission to be a guardian of the James River. We provide a voice for the river and we um, uh, promote uh, citizens to take action and to promote conservation and responsible stewardship of the natural resources of our region. I appreciate the time and, and um, energy that DEQ has put into organizing this opportunity to provide a couple of comments. Um, this is a, a quite complex permit that we are that we're looking at, and I do appreciate also the additional meetings that DEQ has, has uh, organized to share information with the public. Um, but I, I think um, amidst all of these new rules that are being um, applied, including the CCR rule, the ELG rule, the 316B rules, there are still some tremendous opportunities to improve this permit. Uh, we were very involved as an organization during the Brimo um, permit, the Vipdes permit. Uh, we're, we're pleased to see that the triggers that were negotiated through the Brimo settlement are also included in this permit. Similar to our position, for the Green Road Permit. We also believe that the Clean Water Act does not require DEQ to use a mixing zone. Where the technology is available to treat the waste to better standards, DEQ has the authority to set a higher bar and to eliminate the use of this mixing zone. Uh, the fact that the primary pollutants we are discussing this evening are metals which can bioaccumulate, which can have direct and toxic effects on aquatic life, and even people at high uh, levels necessitates the use of the best available technology. Um, as Dominion has already agreed to incorporate these, these trigger points and this additional treatment, uh, we believe that the permit limits need to be updated to reflect these low levels. We're extremely fortunate to have some remarkable resources um, in James River and our region. Atlantic sturgeon were listed as an endangered species in 2012 in a period when we thought uh, they were essentially extirpated from the James River Basin. And in the last decade or so, though, um, we have worked with a number of partners, uh, academic institutions in the region, to study these creatures, to restore habitat, including uh, the construction of Atlantic sturgeon spawning reefs, um, one not far from the Chesterfield Power Station, just downstream. And uh, we, we are witnessing a comeback of this um, really remarkable species. There are several issues that relate that, that really directly to sturgeon, also to other aquatic life um, in the vicinity of Chesterfield. The cooling water. There is very hot water coming out of this plant. It's a once-through cycle, as we heard in the, at the beginning of uh, the DEP presentation. This is old technology. The variance that allows the Indian to continue to discharge this very hot water, and I have personally, in a boat at the at Farga, measured 98 degrees. Uh, during the summertime, right there at the outflow. The study that permits them to discharge that water is, is old. It's over 13 years old. It's time to update that study. It's time to go back and look at it. We need to recognize that we have surgeon that are, that are uh, recovering in this region. We need to set standards that are protective of the most sensitive species we have in our watershed. Okay, Rob, have a couple sentences, please. Absolutely. Um, we also need to look at the intake, the 316B rules. 
we don't think it's adequate to, to wait five years to act. We want to limit the number of fish that are killed by being trapped against these screens at the water intake, and the time to do that is now. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity and the time and energy that DP is putting into this. We will be following additional technical comments at the end of the comment period. And we look forward to working with you more to improve this permit. Thank you. Thank you. I live in North Chesterfield. I just represent myself. Uh, I spoke earlier on the solid waste uh, proposal. And I guess uh, the, the thing I need to say is that I first saw this back in 1967 when I got transferred to Richard and was called out to look at the solid waste on the fly edge. The fly edge was the terrible stuff that was coming out before, and we've concentrated it now. I, I can tell you all kinds of technical things because I spent my career in technical areas. But essentially, we have concentrated that material, and folks have talked about the concentrations of the heavy metals and things along that line, and we're leaving it in an unlined pit. We've got a great deal of runoff coming in there, and I think there are probably ways to fix that. And I did work in the water treatment industry at one point, and there are ways to fix these things. They cost more money. There are ways to move this away from the river, and I think we should certainly consider the unlined pits, moving those away, and I know that's not a part of this, but the water that's going to run over that for a while and the things that you've got to do to dewater that and keep it beside the river just don't make a lot of common sense. Uh, we can get into it technically, talk about that, but you've got a great deal of folks in the Richmond area that know how to treat water extremely well. And I think the Indian is doing what they need to do at this point because they've been given rules that say we've got to act now. They've known they've had a problem for a long while and there are ways to make this better. And I encourage you to do all you can to tighten up the, uh, the rules that you're, you're placing before them. Uh, and I know it's going to cost a little bit more money, and that's going to cost the ratepayers. But, you know, you're saying 30 years out. Uh, 1967 was a lot longer than 30 years ago. So it's going to be there for a while, and I think you need to think about that. So. I, I, I think the process that, that you put together at this point, very technical, will cost a lot of money, but you need to spend a little bit more to take care of the, the process, and it's doable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and DPT staff, thank you for conducting this public hearing. My name is Jonathan Ginsier. I'm a lawyer with the Southern Environmental Law Center in Charlottesville. My comments tonight are made on behalf of SCLC and our client, James River Association. Tonight, I would like to focus on a few related issues. We also plan to submit detailed written comments on the draft. First, the new federal effluent limitations guidelines, or ELGs, for steam electric power generation set technology-based limits that apply to a number of waste streams at Chesterfield. The ELGs require that the new technology-based limits be established as soon as possible, and in no event later then by December 21st, 2023, a little less than seven years from now. This draft permit contains interim limits for certain constituents for several waste streams, but the interim limit is no limit. Only monitoring and reporting are required. The compliance schedule at Part 1B of the permit requires compliance with the final effluent limitations, either within four years of the permit reissuance or by March 29, 2023, a date after this permit would expire, depending on the waste stream. In fact, the final limits for the ongoing discharges from the coal ash ponds before dewatering starts don't apply for four years, and the interim limits for thallium and selenium specify no limit. We understand that Dominion plans to begin dewatering within about a year from now, effectively meaning that no limits would apply to thallium and selenium in that discharge. Second, the permit does set limits for metals like hexavalent chromium, arsenic, selenium, and thallium in the discharge from the coal ash ponds during deep water. But these limits are too high. For example, the permit limits the daily maximum level of arsenic to 440 micrograms per liter, with a monthly average limit of 240. But the chronic standard for toxicity to aquatic life for fresh water is 150 micrograms per liter. Third, there is no requirement that DEQ use a mixing zone in formulating effluent limits. The regulations clearly state that the board may use mixing zone concepts. Those regulations also say that no mixing zone shall be used for or considered as 
a substitute for minimum treatment technology required by the Clean Water Act. And also that the board may not approve a mixing zone that violates the Federal Endangered Species Act. The common thread here is that technology is available to effectively and economically treat the wastewater down to very low levels of these metals, in many cases meeting drinking water standards. Dominion is doing it right now at Possum Point in Brima. <coughs> are posted online. In this draft permit, DEQ has either ignored technology-based limits or deferred them for four to six years. For those waste streams now covered by EPA's DLG rule, there is no need to defer final limits this long. And for all of the wastewater at Chesterfield, there is no justification for using toxic mixing zones to justify weak permit limits. We respectfully urge DEQ not to give Dominion a free pass to pollute the James River. DEQ must change the draft permit to impose interim and final limits on metals in all waste streams that will take effect on a meaningful time frame and to impose much stricter permit limits on coal ash dewatering discharges. Can you wrap it up? Thank you for the opportunity to make these comments. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking as a member of Mass Across the Lake. Um, I feel that uh, many is in violation of the duty permit because Mass Across the Lake binding at the above legal limit of arson. May I call number four? This violation is also found in the Dominion's risk assessment document permit number VA 0004146, dated March 29, 2012. Table 2 shows the monitoring well B19 with an arsenic level of 0 0.008 on 4, 7, 10, and monitoring well B50 at the same level on the same date. Uh, figure 4 map shows water migration directions from the lower pond in section 3.4. Point one point one, page uh, 14 speaks to the groundwater flow from the old ash pond towards wells B50 and B51. All of this data shows groundwater movement. Members of hands across the lake were told at the meeting with many officials the lower pond has a depth of 18 feet. The three wells from table number three show the groundwater levels above the pond floor level. B50 at 4.27 feet, B19 at 16.21 feet, and B41A at 5.81 feet. These, are, these readings were from uh, February 6, 2012. All of this data is verified by the new testing that showed arsenic above acceptable heat. Levels. This permit should not be renewed in light of these violations. All right, and I just want to comment on what's been said by some other people because I have a little time. Uh, and then was said, you know, if they were to dig up the coal ash, they would have to truck it out. Well, they don't have to truck it out because they brought all the coal in by rail. It can be railed out. And taken to uh, landfills as was done in Amelia County with the uh, Duke uh, coal ash. And uh, it, it is the only acceptable thing to do is to dig it up. And in light of this violation, I think it really should be dug up. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your coming. I'm representing our concerned citizen of um, the trip. And um, my question is, is does the permit, does it address uh, like how drought levels have changed and the concentration of what is being released is being changed? And also, I was wondering um, if anyone has addressed the fact that has the public utilities, have they decided to change the way they'll be treating the drinking water? Um, if they will be using more heavy metals into the water, which do affect human life? And my final question is, um, what is the plan beyond the 30 year post-culture care period? And will, they, um, will the DEQ ensure maintenance and monitoring of the capital ash pond? Thank you.
Shepard. I'm a resident of 13416 Bermuda Place Drive in Chester. Uh, most weekends you can find me jogging the Dutch Gap Trail. Uh, but I'm speaking on behalf of Citizens Climate Lobby. As a citizen, I'm not satisfied with the permit because it's not clear to me that all the coal ash is to be in line to storage. As a volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby, I'm struck with this discussion on how our financial incentives are on one side of the equation while our good intentions are on the other. As a public company, Dominion Power naturally works to maximize shareholder return and minimize energy costs. It does this in part by externalizing certain costs, which is why we're here tonight. What if we could get money and good intentions on the same side of this equation? We could assess rising carbon fees where coal, natural gas, and oil come out of the ground and give that money back to American families. The economic incentives for fossil fuels would then gradually disappear and the smokestacks at Dutch Gap would go silent. Until we push members of our Congress to enact this, we will fight battles over pipelines and coal ash ponds and lose some of them. The larger problem, climate change, will continue to grow. Solar power and wind turbines in Virginia will continue to fail to replace fossil fuels. As a member of Citizens Climate Lobby, I will be working as a nonpartisan volunteer to pass carbon fee and dividend in the 2017 Congress as national legislation. If my statement seems to digress from the purposes of this hearing, I apologize. But I feel it's important to provide perspective on the continuing carbon emissions at Dutch Gap and across Virginia. We are treating one symptom here tonight, but the patient cannot be cured in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Tom Pack, you are. I'm Vice President, hands across the lane. The concerns this evening are several fold. Number one, what's going on today is discharge of toxic waste into the James River at Farragut Dump. The data was published a couple weeks ago in the Chesterfield Observer and details provided to Mr. Winter uh, yesterday. He asked for one of the reasons we have this problem deals with the fact that we're dealing with technology that doesn't apply to fly ash. Fly ash is very light and fluffy, whereas stormwater requires particles to settle in ponds. And these particles just float on by without settling. So they're disobeying the law. We don't have any remedies for what happens when technology is not embodied in the law. So that's a case for improvement. The second observation is the risk management it seems to be a lot of boilerplate and doesn't address the real conditions of the most sensitive population using the waters downstream of the coal ash store. Children of Chesterfield County taking kayak lessons. They're in and out of the kayaks in waist deep water contaminated with this coal ash. The risk analysis doesn't deal with that population, nor with the possible risk of ingestion of this water that could precipitate known cancers. The third comment deals with capping in place. The capping in place only does water that comes down from the top. What we have is a toxic brew, you know, very much like Mr. Winter's coffee analogy. The particles are so small that they'll dissolve the slight twelve cold brew coffee, very micro particles. The same particles that disobey the law will go into solution and cause the toxic brew. And the capping in place doesn't do anything for the water that comes in five sides of the uh, containment system. So I would suggest 
rethinking what we need to do with all this. The laws need to be updated a little bit to understand whether or not my pocketbook is going to be tipped as a taxpayer or as a rate payer to buying electricity or as an investor. Okay, can you wrap it up? I'll wrap up very quickly. The, um, um, I guess it's in, in summary, there's no greater risk than for us to be content with coal ash being deposited in a 100-year floodplain with just a cap in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm also a member of Hands Across the Lake. What I present to you tonight for you to take a look at the method of testing that you're doing presently for the fly ash, the heavy metals, is called T-Clip. This journal that I presented to you was published only last July 2015, called Suitability of Leach Testing Methods for Fly Ash and Slag. The method that we're using right now was developed, which is the uh, called T-Clip. I won't go into all of it, we could spend the next hour. The toxicity uh, characteristic leaching procedure, T-clip, requires the use of an extraction fluid made of buffered acidic medium to run to the test and a direct acid digestion method was carried out for the determination of heavy metals. An improved leaching test method has been suggested for environmental assessment of coal ash representative of actual field conditions. Well, we need to take a look at, this was a method from 1987. That's 30 years ago. We need to take a look at the best methods that we can develop before you uh, renew this permit. Some of the test methods are called SGLP, synthetic groundwater, leaching procedure. You can look at other methods in the, in the document. But basically, the leaching of heavy metals from dump fly ash and slag ash have a negative impact on the environment and should be reduced by the leaching assessment of these wastes. So the leaching test is one important aspect to the environmental assessment of the remediation metals or measures for the solidification and stabilization of contaminant settlements. pH is an important factor. You need to look at the different test methods and choose the test method that is the best. T-clip is the cheapest. I'm familiar with the procedure. I used to work in the industry. My analogy is similar to uh, when I was the chairman of the Board of Building Code Appeals in Chesterfield County for 12 years, citizens would be concerned about how their homes were constructed. And they would come to our meetings and the builder who was under the, uh, that constructed their homes would say he built the home according to code. And I would ask those citizens, do you know, do you understand exactly what it just said? 99.9% .9 of the time they said no. I said, what he just told you was they did it to the minimum standard allowed by law. Not the median, not the maximum, but the minimum standard. T-clip is the minimum standard for testing. We need to find better, better testing methods and use the best method to ensure that we're protecting our citizens. We shouldn't go to the cheapest method and the minimum standard. We have to do better. It's our grandchildren that will pay the price. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Graham Jennings. I represent myself. Uh, not a lot to say that hasn't been said very eloquently and much better than I could before, although uh, just from a simple cost-effective standpoint, uh, digging, digging the coal ash up and moving it to a different location is cost effective simply on the fact that the long term effects that could could arise from leaving it in the ground and contaminating the groundwater, uh, 
paying to clean that up could be a lot more than uh, if we just moved it away. Um, so that's that's the main point I wanted to make, and also uh, just thank you for the opportunity for being here, and uh, I wanted to thank Amelia for coming out and doing this as well. So, thank you. Thanks. Representing myself, I just want to echo the concerns about the uh, heavy metals um, levels, as well as the temperature of the water discharge and uh, groundwater contamination. Thank you. I'm with the VRH. The VRH is a citizen environmental rights militia. As a member of the VRH, I would like to deliver this petition to the VADEQ, signed by more than 1,100 individuals. The members of the VADEQ clearly being called to respond to this petition are David Taylor, Jefferson Reynolds, Kathleen O'Connell, John Eli, Justin Williams, Brett Fisher, and Leslie Romanchik. The petition clearly signifies concern over the quality of well water due to Dominion Power's coal ash pond and clearly declares that the current dewatering permit to be put on hold until Dominion Power has properly conducted sufficient research on residential and commercial water wells surrounding the area of the Chesterfield Station's coal ash pond being addressed in this permit. The petition demands that you require Dominion, Virginia, Dominion and Virginia Power to pay for third party professional water testing of residents' drinking water and well water in the immediate area of the coal ash pond. This demand is for all Dominion power stations that are slated for coal ash cleanup and lifetime capping around the Commonwealth. Following the Duke Ener Energy's 2014 Dan River coal ash bill, the state of North Carolina required Duke Energy to pay full for residential well water testing. The testing found that 93% of residential groundwater wells within 1,000 feet of similar coal ash ponds were contaminated with dan dangerous chemicals found in coal ash. The timeline of coal ash leaching is still undetermined by inorganic chemists. Some professionals predict leaching toxins could become worse in 50 plus years. Even communities are left with Dominion's coal ash waste sites environmentally displaced. If Dominion Power is going to move forward with closure plans, we demand a thorough assessment of current condition of well water and communities that live near coal ash ponds be tested. Virginia residents have the environmental right to know if their water is currently safe to drink. We also demand that Dominion and Virginia Power be held responsible for continued third-party testing and monitoring the well water in the immediate area of capped coal ash pond to ensure our water tables and aquifer are safe for technique and safe for consumption in the future. Furthermore, I would like to address a more specific concern regarding Dominion Power's Chesterfield Power Station. During the public information session on June 22, the VADQ made it clear that Dominion Power is under under pre-existing permits has already been dewatering the coal ash ponds at the Chesterfield Power Plant. Before the permit we are discussing this evening moves forward, I think Dominion Power and the Virginia Department of Environment and Quality owes the public a full report on the amount of untreated coal ash water that have been discharging into Virginia waterways. In a specific case, I would like to see Dominion Power show how they have conducted according to requirements on the past permits through making all monitor of outfall 004 the drainage of the lower ash pond of Chesterfield's power station public. As acknowledged by the VADEQ, Dominion Power has been flushing out coal ash water into the James River through outfall 004. And this needs to be clearly understood by the public before further dewatering of coal ash is permitted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much of what was said earlier, uh, some specific problems I have with this permit are I feel that the uh, use of a mixing zone needs to be eliminated as a uh, solution to dilute the solution. Uh, I'm concerned with the thermal levels of water being released and specifically its impact on organic sturgeon. Um, it's also come to my attention that the uh, NOAA, uh, North American Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, is currently looking at categorizing a large swath of the uh, East Coast watersheds as uh, critical habitat for sturgeon and the James River that would extend up to Botcher's Dam, which is upriver of where uh, this water would be discharged, placing it within this critical sturgeon habitat. And I'd like to see uh, the final permit reflect more consideration as to how this would impact the sturgeon habitat and spawning. Okay. Thank you. Christine Abbott. Uh, yeah. Christine Abbott. Right. Like the millennial, I made it. I'm a resident of Chesterfield County. Um, I'm not completely familiar with all the technical parts of this, but what I do understand is that we've been going through climate talks in Paris lately, um, and we understand that there's going to be a two degree um, increase in temperature if everyone continues to follow the rate that we're going with some um, acceptance of new climate change rules. 
And when I consider this new permit and the acknowledgement of incredibly hot water going into the river, um, to me that is climate change of our James River. And that is a whole new ecosystem that is facing something much worse than we're encountering in our own atmosphere. Um, so I think not only when we quantify the loss of the Atlantic sturgeon, we also need to begin to understand that we're, we need to quantify losses that we haven't already seen. Um, you can't already predict all of the losses that could be there. Negative externalities are always going to show up in different ways, and right now we have something obvious, and we need to consider um, what we can't quantify, what we can't put into these analyses, and consider where our pollution and our dirty industries could be going um, to a better place. Um, and I know that that cost will could fall on ratepayers, it could fall on the state, it could fall on private industry, but the, part, the point is, is that we're all willing to make a one-time cost to get this pollution out of our water and to not have to face this perpetual pollution um, and potentially um, eradication of species uh, as long as we're willing to just pay a little bit more right now. I think we'll find that the community will, will find uh, alternative solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are really privileged to live in a country where we do have a free and to openly address issues like this before we prevent we're doing tonight. So again, I would like to thank you all for coming and appreciate this comment. And just to get the closing date and time for the final comments. Mr. Harry, what about closing?